This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit like and subscribe and that notification button and on whatever you're listening on. I am Mike Williams, creator of Legacy Battle. My panelists tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King. And and you might be surprised to see our, our baseball guru here, but from the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, Scott Crawford's filling in for us, and we, we appreciate you coming on, Scott. Our special guest tonight, we're, we're joined by the, the perfect guest for tonight's topic, which is the greatest women's tennis player of the 90s after Steffi Graf, because if you count Steffi Graf, it's pointless, so... But uh, so we're joined by a WTA player. She has 223 single wins, 88 double wins. That's what I was able to find. There may be a few more. A career title, 2-0 record in the Fed Cup. So, yeah, she represented the U.S. there. Uh, she served uh, for Team USA on the committees for the Fed Cup as well as the Olympics. She's a, a silver medalist at the 95 Pan Am Games. So we have Ann Grossman here. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good. It, we're we're happy to have you here. <laughs> and uh, yes, so as I said, our debate, greatest player, women's player of the 90s. And we're going to start out tonight with uh, Scott. Yeah, I picked uh, Gabriella Sabatini. I mean, uh, the, the list of, of ladies tennis players in the 90s was just amazing to begin with. When you look down all the list of great players, I mean, all the ones we're talking about are, are in the Tennis Hall of Fame. So it's really hard to... Uh, argue, you know, who's the best overall when they're all being honored at the highest point. Uh, but Gabriella, I mean, this is a little bit before the 90s, but in the mid-80s, she was ranked the number one world junior player. Um, so she really had a, a up-and-coming stardom right from the junior age player if you're ranked number one in the world. Um, over, overall, she got to number three in the world when she was, she was playing. Um, she won almost 900 matches over her career. She got a silver medal in the the Seoul Olympics. She won 41 career titles. And uh, talking, um, you know, I know we're not hitting on Steffi Graf, but Steffi Graf presented Gabrielle Sabatini with her Hall of Fame uh, presentation uh, when she got it in the Hall of Fame. So uh, Gabrielle and Steffi played quite a bit together. And um, Gabrielle, she was ranked number 20th of the number 20th of the greatest female players in the last 50 years back in 2018. So she uh, she's right up there with all these other people we're talking about. And I think, you know, when you can be ranked number one junior player in the world, when you play in the Olympics, when you uh, when you're ranked top uh, female players in the last 50 years, um, she's right up there with the best. So, yeah, and she, I go ahead. Go ahead. No, yeah. I was just saying she's uh, she's amazing. So love all those stats. And I, I remember, I, I can't remember the exact year. I want to say it was mid nineties. You played her in the U S open, right? If I'm, if I'm yes, I did. right. So, so you're very familiar with her style. How, how can you beat Sabatini? Does she have any weaknesses and what do you think of her overall game? I mean, Gabby, uh, well, I played her several times actually. Um, I played her the first time I ever played her was actually, I was playing in an exhibition in Tokyo and, um, I played a Japanese player before um, in the first round, and then I beat Conchita Martinez in the second round. It was called the Gunzi. And then I had to play Gabby, and she was four in the world at the time. I was 19 years old. You can actually look up the match on YouTube. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, I was so young. Actually, I might have even had like that dress on right there that I was wearing behind you. Um, and I think I was, I was using that racket actually. So, um, could be the picture who knows. Yeah. Anyway, that's, uh, but, uh, I think that picture was taken when I was on clay court, but, um, for sure, uh, the racket I was, I was using, but anyway, so that was my first time playing her. And, um, obviously that was a huge atmosphere being in Tokyo, being in the finals of this exhibition and, uh, being in Japan, which they just love tennis so much. Um, I was definitely overwhelmed playing her and um, it was definitely a step that I needed to get used to playing the best players in the world. So um, if you watch that match, I, I was just missing balls. I was putting too much pressure on myself and going for way too much. I felt like I was overplaying. And so that was a great learning experience. But yeah, I went on and um, I played her in the, I'm pretty sure it was the 91 US Open. No, 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 no. I played her in 95 US Open. Yeah, because, oh, actually, I'm sorry, 1996 U.S. 96? Open. Okay. Yeah, because my my uh, husband-to-be 
was uh, was in the stands, and it, he had just play, he had just swam in the '96 uh, Olympics. His name is Eric Wunderlich. So, but actually, I beat Gabby in Berlin, and I think it was 1994. Um, I know this is terrible. My stats, I'm getting really old. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, I did have a win over her there and, um, it was, uh, it was awesome to, I played her on the red clay in Berlin and, um, she was the most uh, unbelievable athletic player, um, besides being beautiful, right? She was beautiful human being. And honestly, inside she's an amazing person as well um whenever you know she was always so genuine and gracious whenever she would lose besides like you know having every shot in the book um she was so fluid out there she moved beautifully um you know she had the one-handed backhand she could drop shot unbelievable come into the net all around player um I'm really surprised that she didn't win more grand slams um because of her athleticism and, and her body and, you know, how she was built. But I, it just shows that this generation was unbelievable with players. Like, it was stacked, and everybody was just so mentally tough. So Gabby is amazing person, along with an a unbelievable game, and she was able to win the U.S. Open. So um, kudos to her on winning a Grand Slam, and winning the U.S. Open is the, a, the toughest Grand – I'm one of the toughest Grand – well, I think it's the toughest Grand Slam to win because of – um, there's so much going on. It's New York City. It's loud. Um, the atmosphere is so intense. And then you have to be able to calm down and, you know, uh, be able to rest the next day and then come back and play again. So um, amazing, amazing, amazing player. So. Well, we'll move on to Brian and Brian's repping too. So give us one of them now, Brian. All right. So we got a, we got a Rosa Sanchez Vicario. Uh, she hails out of the nation, nation of Spain, and she has more medals than any other Spanish Olympian with two silvers and two bronzes, uh, which she won at Barcelona in 1992 and Atlanta in 1996. And in 1991, she also helped Spain win their first ever Fed Cup title. And then she won it again in 93, 94, 95, and 99. Uh, over the course of the 1990s decade, she won about $15 million in prize money. Uh, head to head against Lindsay Davenport, she was seven and five. Versus Sabatini, she was 11 and 12, but she dominated her on the hard court with a 6 and 2 record. Uh, she was able to beat Monica Sellis to win the 1998 French Open. Sanchez Vicario made it to 11 Grand Slam singles finals during the decade, 10 women's doubles, and five mixed doubles. She ended up with 12 wins out of all that, and she was ranked number one in the world for singles in 1996. Uh, the thing I admired the most about Sanchez Vicario was her tenacity. Uh, she would just flat out to just refused to concede a point, uh, would almost do anything to return a volley, even like the low percentage ones. And, and many times she would just miraculously save a point that way. Uh, it could be very demoralizing for her opponents because she almost always was the hardest working player on the court. Uh, and this earned her the nickname, the Barcelona Bumblebee from tennis uh, commentator Bud Collins. And it truly fits who she was, a great Spaniard and a relentless and tireless worker warrior. So that's Ronsa Sanchez Vicario. Yeah, nice you job. got that down. You got that down. Oh, uh, amazing. Uh, she is actually one of my really, really good friends. Um, we speak very often. Uh, we play in some charity events together. Um, I played her many times. It was actually, it always seemed to, uh, I always seemed to draw her in the Grand Slams, um, whether it was third round, fourth round. I lost her third round at the Australian Open. Uh, I played her in the fourth round of the U.S. Open. That's the year that she went on to win. And I think 95 when she won the U.S. Open, um, when she beat uh, Steffi Graf in the finals. So um, she she was, uh, you know, she got the Bumblebee uh, nickname because not only was she a Bumblebee and she ran down everything and she was so light on her feet and had every shot as well, but uh, her attitude was exceptional. Um, she was always so happy, you know, extremely nice, so nice always to you. Um, and I just like, when I'm around her right now, she just always is so uplifting and just so powerful. 
on, um, on, on how she is with you and makes you believe that really that you can achieve anything. Whenever I talk to her, she's I- incredible to me. And uh, I, I really cherish our friendship. Any difference in the European game to the American game? Is there a difference in the player styles? I mean, I think that she had incredible discipline. Um, the Spanish players normally do. And I mean, she had her brother, Emilio, uh, who was, you know, fifth in the world. And uh, her brother, uh, Javier, who was, um, I'm not sure how high his ranking was. I think he might have been like 40, but he was an exceptional athlete. He probably, you know, could have been much higher. Um, But I think that because she had those brothers and she was always practicing with them, growing up with them, that uh, she was able to handle any pace. She had every shot in the book. She knew where to put the ball when you'd least expect it, but she had incredible discipline, right? And her movement was unbelievable. So I think that just like what set her apart, and that's why her record just stands stands there. I mean, it's 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 incredible. So we're gonna move on to Monica Sellis, um, and we we've talked about her before on on past shows. So everybody knows the the, the stabbing incident. So you know. We don't need to go into great detail on that, but uh, let's just start with the facts here. Four Australian Open wins, three French, two U.S. Opens, two U.S. Opens, and a Wimbledon in 92. So we got like the 12 days of Christmas going there here. Um, She reached number one in the world. She had a 36-match winning streak and won six consecutive tournaments from 1990 to 92. Uh, Keep in mind, in, in 1990, she's only 16 years old. So she's doing this all at a very young age. Um, then obviously derailed in 93 by the, by the backstabbing on the court. Um, she would miss two years during that time period and she suffered from depression and an eating disorder as a result of this. So she was dealing with that for the rest of her career when she returns in 94. And when she comes back in 94, she wins her first tournament, which was the Canadian open. And while there, she sets a record for the fewest games dropped by the champion throughout the tournament. So just a very impressive comeback right off the bat. The following month, she makes the U.S. Open Finals and loses to Steffi Graf, which there's never any shame in losing to Steffi Graf. Um, and the only slam that she did win, though, after her return uh, was Australia in 96. Um, but she did pick up two Fed Cup wins in 96 and 99 for Team USA. Um, so, you know, she's missing a, a couple years of stats that could have added into this. From 90 to 92, she was the GOAT. The, 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 there's... There's no way around that. And and she was still very successful from 94 to 99. And she was so good that she was an honorable mention when we did our uh, greatest women's tennis show with Elise Bergen. So she was good enough for an honorable mention on that. And your your, your thoughts on Monica Sellis and, and did she have a peak that maybe we didn't get to see because of, of what happened? Um. Well, first, let me just... Uh say a little bit actually the picture that's uh that's there on the uh i'm leaning backwards hitting a backhand um next to where i'm not where i was really small that's on the center court at wimbledon and i actually was playing monica sellis in that picture um that was in 1996 uh i remember that because that was the only time i got to play on center court which was absolutely amazing and to play against her was not fun so, <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, uh, it it was amazing to be out there with her, and I, I'm I'm so honored and blessed that I had that opportunity. But uh, I mean, I I grew up at Nick Voltaire Tennis Academy, and um, I watched Monica train when she came in, um, and when she was like 11, 12 years old, and she trained like you cannot even imagine. She was on the court eight hours a day. Um, just nonstop with her brother, with her dad, and, and you know, sometimes Nick. But um, it was I, – I can't even explain to you on how hard this girl worked. So um, it's really unfortunate what happened to her because she definitely um, – I think she would have been the greatest player of all time. Uh, she was so disciplined. She hit the ball so hard. One time I was filming a Nike commercial with her and uh, I was supposed to be the player against her. And she had so much, you know, energy and momentum because the Nike commercial was about her. I couldn't even get the ball back. Like 
<laughs> she's an absolute beast. Like it was insane. It was embarrassing. Um, so she, she was so incredibly powerful, took the ball so early and, you know, um, but I, I, I'm, I'm super, you know, super sad. And that unfortunate, uh, incident happened. And because I think that really took away like so many grand slams that, that she would have won. So it's, it's really disappointing for our, you know, for women's tennis on, on, on what that happened, because she would have just, um, you know, it, she was just taking it to another level. Let's move on to our final player tonight. Go ahead, Brian. Okay, so we got uh, we got Lindsay Davenport out of uh, Laguna Beach, California. Uh, she started off the decade by winning the uh, Ojai Tennis Tournament in 1990. Uh, by 1994, she worked her way up into the top 20, and she scored some quality Grand Slam match wins over uh, Nicole Bradkey and Mary Jo Fernandez. In 1995, she hired uh, Robert Van uh, Hoff as her coach, and that's when her career really took off. 1996, she won the Fed Cup. Uh, the tour finals for doubles, the French Open for doubles, uh, the singles uh, uh, Olympic gold at the Atlanta Games. And then the final three years of the 90s, she won the uh, double tours final twice more, uh, U.S. Open and Wimbledon for doubles, the Fed Cup again, uh, the tour finals, U.S. Open and Wimbledon as a singles player. Davenport was a was a very powerful server, an aggressive player who was not afraid to gamble. More often than not, that gamble paid off. And she was able to keep her opponents on their heels. Uh, Serena Williams once said that Davenport was the hardest hitter she ever faced. And she believed that Davenport was the most powerful player of all time. She was a um, French Open away from a Grand Slam. Wow. Yeah. Um, the thing, the crazy thing about uh, Lindsay is that everybody said that she moved slow. But the thing was, is that she anticipated unbelievable and she had the best hands. So if she could get to the ball, she always made the shot, which was very deceiving because everybody would be like, oh, you just got to move Lindsay. Yeah, well, the thing was, is that she was, a, she's 6'3". She had a huge serve and her ground strokes were massive and it was pretty hard to get her on the defensive. So, you know, easier said than done. But um, I mean, uh, Lindsay is an amazing person. She, um, she just took over uh, captain of Billie Jean King Cup so congratulations to her, and I think she'll do an amazing job. And, um, yeah, I got to play Lindsay, and so I know what it felt like to be on the other side. And let me just tell you, that was my least favorite person to play, her and Monica, for sure, because of just how powerful how powerful she was. And Brian, was it, she, she spent like 98 weeks at number one. Something, something like it that. It was some uh, streak like that. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was over, I think it was like a year and three quarters or something like that. Yeah. 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 I knew it was a long time. And she had a great rivalry with uh, Venus Williams, uh, so much so that that was on a rivalry show. But uh, right. Let's, yeah. move, let, let's move into our vote here tonight. Uh, Scott, who are you taking? I got to go with uh, hearing all these things and looking at all their records. I got to go with Lindsay Davenport. I think her she, her longevity, all the matches she played, the Olympic gold, number one for like you said, almost two years. Um, I go, I go, Lindsay. Okay, Brian. I, I tell you, this is this is really tough. Um, I I think I think I'm going to go with Monica Sellis, and I mean I know about the injury and everything, and I know she wasn't herself afterwards, but. Man, I mean, she was just during that that those first three years of the decade, just unbelievable. And I believe that you know, Celis and and uh, and Graf would have been the would have been the greatest robbery of all time if that if that doesn't happen. So I'm gonna go with her. Yeah, right up with their uh, Nadal and Federer. That would have been a, that would have been huge. Oh, geez, I've been torn between Sabatini and uh, Picario tonight. Uh, I don't know why Lindsay just didn't do it for me, but. Uh, yeah, I I think I, I think I'm gonna throw one uh, for Sabatini here, so I'm taking her, and we come to you. Who 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 would you pick uh, as your goat after Graf? My goat after Graf. Oh, geez, that's so tough. I mean, listen to Arantxa's record on not only was she a great singles player, but she uh, doubles on how well she did. She was all around, um, and then uh, I mean Monica. I mean, Lindsay, amazing, but I have to go with, uh, I have to go with Monica because I, 
to watch her. I mean, she could hit the corner inside each the corner and the baseline like at will. I mean, she was absolutely incredible. And um, I, I, I think I have to go with Monica. Okay, so that's fine because that's a win for me. So thank <laughs> I'm totally down with that. All right, let's move into our Q and A and a win for Monica Sellis. Uh, I normally the winner gets the first question, but I'm going to pass that off. We'll go Scott, Brian, me. Yeah, and I just wondering um, what what do you what do you see as the main difference between today's women's game and and back when you played in the '90s? Is there a real one main difference between the the style of play or the how the game's played these days? Um, I just think that that the the strings and the rackets have changed the game so much um you know you know people are constantly saying oh the players need to come to the net they need to come in but uh i don't think they are they understand how fast the ball is moving if you if you literally are standing on the court with these ladies and how hard the ball is coming off their racket and with the strings you can be anywhere on the court. You could be so far back deep into the, you know, corner on the forehand side and be able to hit this insane angle. Um, it's just, it just is coming off the racket so much, so much quicker. And uh, so I think that's why the game has changed so much. Also in the physicality of it. I mean, these girls are in incredible shape and, you know, they not only, I feel like they are, they're just, they're outworking everybody. I mean, if you look at the shape that they're in, I mean, you see Sakari, I mean, she's a beast. These girls are beasts. Um, it's, it's actually incredible to watch. I've seen them in the, because I was coaching Francesca De Lorenzo on the tour. And uh, I've been in the, I've been in the fitness room with these girls and they're training, if not just as hard or harder than the men. So it's really like sometimes it, it, it you know, kind of breaks my heart to hear that, you know, people ripping on the women's game and saying, oh, the men, the women don't work as hard. They're working harder because number one, it's harder for us to play this game. The guys are so, they're so incredible athletes and we have to make up with it for, for all of our hard work. I'm not saying we're not incredible athletes. We definitely are, but some things come e easier for on the men's side. So um, we, we're just, I think the women are just, uh, they're incredible right now with their movement, with their ball striking. Um, so it's its really fun to watch. So, and uh, I'm going to take you back to August 11th, 1994, Virginia Slims of Los Angeles. Ann Grossman's able to defeat the great Martina Navratilova. I understand there was some controversy in that match. So what do you remember about that one? Oh yeah, I was serving, um, I was down, uh, let's see, I was down four or five, 1540. Um, I was serving and um, the, uh, so I was down match point because this was in the, in the second set. I was down a set, yeah, four or five, 1540. And uh, the umpire overruled a call in my favor and um, which was the correct call. And uh, I went on to win seven five six four in the third set. So it was, uh, I think Martina was three in the world at the time. And it was in uh, Virginia Slums of LA and Manhattan Beach and Manhattan Beach Country Club. And it was, uh, it was awesome. It was such an amazing match. And um, one that, uh, I don't know, that I can't, I can't even describe it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, a great lead way into my question. So, I want to know what, what's going through your head when you, you look over the net and you see a player like a Navratilova or a Steffi Graf over there. What, what's going through your head? And are, are there maybe some players who feel like they've already lost when they see that on the other side? Martina was incredible because she had uh, this mystique and that when she walked on the court, she had uh, – uh, I, I can't even, I mean, like, I want to say, like, attitude, but, like, I mean, she put the fear of God in you. Like, you were, like, you know, it's, I can't even put it into words on how she made you feel. Um, and Chrissy ever had the same, um, you know, what is the word? Um, I'm, Aura, maybe? 
Yeah, just mystique, right? They're mystique. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, Martina and Chrissy, incredible mystique. Same with Steffi, same with Monica. I mean, all those girls had incredible mystiques, right? But Martina really knew, she really knew how to put it on. And, um, and I definitely was incredibly intimidated of her. So what helped me get over the hump is, is that I practiced with her a few times and I actually beat her in practice. And I was like, Anne, if you can beat her in practice, you can, you can do it in a match. You can do it in a tournament. What's the difference? So I think by me practicing with her, that really helped and beating her. And then uh, the other times when I came super close to her, I was on this really super fast carpet in Zurich, Switzerland, lost in three sets. And then I had to play her again the next week in um, uh, Filderstad in the Porsche tournament, lost her three sets again. And then uh, the next time I played her, put me over the hump and I, that's when I beat her. So sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta stick with it. Although I do have a good story is that I was, let's see, my dad was still alive. My dad died when I was 20, but I turned pro in 1988. I was 17. I think I played her either when I was, I think 18 years old and it was Virginia Slims of uh, DC. I lost to her in 50 minutes on the really fast su Supreme court inside in front of 10,000 people. And uh, my dad had me on the court the next day at 6 AM practicing because he was, he was a little upset with me that I got destroyed. But uh, anyway, that, that was humiliating me getting beat by her. But uh, I went on to prevail and and to have the last win over. So I'm pretty pumped about that. <laughs> <laughs> Say yeah. more. Go ahead, Scott. All right. Uh, you played in the Australian Open, French Open, Wimbledon, U.S. Open, obviously all those great Grand Slam tournaments. Um, did you have a, a preference for for court style or, or uh, surface style? And and uh, what would why did you like it better? Well, I have to say that um, my favorite surface was uh, the French Open clay. I um, I loved it there. I, that, those were always my best results. I think at one time I had like the highest winning percentage because I never lost first round at, at that Grand Slam for like many years. Um, I remember looking in like this record book and I was like way at the top. I was like, wow, that's amazing. But I think also is that I love to travel. And so... You know, when we finished our season here on the green clay um, at Amelia Island, I immediately went straight to, I think one of our first tournaments was Barcelona. I was always the first American to, to head over to get on the red clay. Um, I, uh, I wasn't afraid to like go and travel on my own and, and to figure things out. So I was at least on the red clay four to five weeks before the French Open started. So then... I felt really comfortable going into the French. Like I made the finals of Strasbourg the week before one year. Um, so that's just, um, I don't know. For some reason, uh, it, it suited my game. And But it can play differently there. Sometimes it can play super fast. And um, like, you know, you feel like you have ice skates on and you, you still have to take the ball early because it can play hard and fast and so slippery. And then it depends on the weather. It could really be super slow. I remember one time I was finishing my match in the third round. It felt like peanut butter out there um, because the courts were getting soaked, but they let me continue on. They stopped all the other matches and it completely changed, you know, the, your style of game. So it, it, it can different, it, it can change all the time. And I think I was able to adapt um, because of my game style um, I was able to hit sometimes high and heavy, or I could take the ball early. I wasn't going to overpower anybody, so I feel like that's why uh, the red clay was uh, was my was my friend out there. Oh, and you, you mentioned her earlier. You you were able to coach uh, Francesca Di Lorenzo, uh, who had a pretty nice career, and and now she's a coach herself at the University of Central Florida. So, what would you how how would you describe your time working with her? I mean, I started her when she was 10 years old at New Albany Country Club. And um, so I really um, kind of gave her her foundation for the game. Obviously, I did. I worked with her for 12 years. Uh, she went on to, you know, play at Ohio State because that's where, you know, that's where I was working with her. And um, she went on to have an amazing career there when the NCAAs and, and doubles, which is amazing. Um 
So, yeah, I mean, I got her to 118 in the world, and that's super special because uh, I don't know how many coaches have just been with one player to start them at the very beginning when she literally batted the ball back and forth. She didn't have any strokes. And uh, taking a player to that level, she she made 11 in the world in juniors, um, you know, number one in the, uh, in the net, in, uh, NCAA in singles besides the doubles. So um, I'm pretty proud of myself. I think that's a huge accomplishment. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. And um, to to work with her. We'll get you out here with this tonight. I'm going to make it a two parter. So. Uh, my, my first question is you're part of that team USA committee. So were you part of like picking the players that would represent team USA? And if not, what did you do for that? And then we see a lot of younger tennis players now turning to pickleball and pickleball is really becoming a big thing. How do you see that affecting tennis moving forward? Oh, that's a tough question. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer not to choose the pickleball route, but uh, look, I mean, I can't really speak because um, I tennis is in my blood and I grew up on a farm. I at one time had no heat or water and my ticket was getting out of where I came from. So I, you know, I'm now the uh, CEO of the Women's Tennis Coaching Association and I, um, you know, tennis has given me everything. So you know, I can't speak for for people that are moving to the to the side of the pickleball. I really, to, honestly, to tell you, don't know any of all that stuff that's going on because I'm so focused on, um, you know, uh, building the female athlete, men and women working with female players, um, and so. And anyway, I I don't know what to say on that side. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. It, yeah. It tell, Tell us what you did for for uh, the committee there uh, for Team USA. Um, no, I just like it was more like just dealing with like um, rules and stuff. It didn't really have anything to do with uh, picking the team. So um, yeah, it put me on. Um, yeah, I was on the USOC uh, on the on the tennis side. I represented tennis in the sport of the Olympics, but it was just mainly like rules and you know all that kind of stuff that that goes on on the olympic side so i i did not pick the team but um yeah so and i was on the usta nominating committee too where you pick the board um for uh for the usta so i i was able to do that as well but um now i'm um also besides the wtca i'm um being a, a middle zone coach um under jim fannin under his platform so I have a lot going on on the side of tennis. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, Anne, so much for joining us tonight. We, we appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you so much. It was awesome. Awesome. I want to remind everybody, hit that like, subscribe, and notification button. We want to thank everyone for watching. We'll see you all next time. Everybody have a great night.